Um, I'm very pleased to say that this webinar is uh, co-sponsored by the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research. And uh, I am very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Nancy Nason Clark as our speaker this evening. Dr. Nason Clark is a recently retired professor of sociology at UNB. And uh, she received a PhD from the London School of Economics and Political Science in England. She's the editor and uh, or author of 15 books and has served as president of uh, three professional organizations, um, Society for the Scientific Study of Religion, the Association for the Sociology of Religion and the Religious Research Association. And she has also served two terms as editor of Sociology of Religion, a quarterly review. She's been the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including induction as a member of the Royal Society of Canada. So she is very well qualified uh, to speak on this topic and we're really looking forward to what she has to share with us uh, on the whole matter of uh, domestic violence. So let's give her our attention. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I count it a great honor and privilege to be with you all this evening. And I'd like to thank the Anglican Diocese of Fredericton and Nancy Stevens in particular for the invitation from the Christian Forum series to speak on this cold uh, January evening from the warmth of my office at home. I extend a particular note of appreciation to Sean Branch from the diocese for offering us technical support. So if anything goes wrong tonight, it's up to Sean. Thanks too for our co-sponsors, the Mural McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research at the University of New Brunswick. And I hope that those of you joining us tonight will find the atmosphere warm and welcoming and engaging. Thank you in advance for listening to what's on my heart and mind. But before I begin my remarks, I'd like to introduce the director of the Mural McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research, Dr. Catherine Holtman, and she's going to offer a few words to highlight the work of the center. Thank you, Kathy, for joining us. Thanks, Nancy. I too want to thank the Anglican Diocese of Fredericton for organizing this event and for um, in, uh, in inviting us to be a co-sponsor of the event and to offer uh, just a few words about um, the center and what we do. So the Mira McQueen Ferguson Center is the result of a partnership between the Ferguson Foundation and the University of New Brunswick. And we've been in operation for uh, over 25 years. And we basically have three components to our mandate. And the first is uh, exactly what you're participating in this evening. We do what we call knowledge transfer. We try to translate the results of the research that our various teams and projects undertake on all sorts of aspects of uh, family violence and violence against women and translate it into a form and into a, uh, a language that is easier and easily accessible by a broad public. So this is exactly the kind of thing that we encourage all of our researchers to do. And we are so grateful when uh, community partners are also interested in this kind of work. If you want to um, stay up to date on our own knowledge transfer activities, I invite you to visit our website at unb.ca slash MMMFC. We also have uh, various social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, and most recently now we're on LinkedIn. So you can follow us on any of those platforms. And if you contact us, we'll happily put you on our, our quarterly e-news email list. In addition to knowledge transfer, we engage in uh, education and professional development opportunities. So we have a family violence issue certificate program that's offered at UNB. And that is a course-based program for both students and uh, people in the field that want a little extra knowledge. We also offer regular opportunities for professional development. And some of these are tailored specifically for groups like uh, social workers and police officers. And sometimes we have more general opportunities for people that want to learn specific skills. And finally, um, the third focus of our work at the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research is research. And Nancy is one of the founders and one of the founding, um, a member of the founding research teams at the center. And the original vision of those who founded the center 
was that they would carry out what we call action-oriented collaborative research. So research that whose end goal is social change, depending on what aspect of violence they're looking at. And so in, in the case of the religion and violence research team, there's been a real concerted effort to make sure that uh, religious leaders, uh, congregations, and people of faith are part of our research projects and that the results of our research are used in ways that serve them and help them to respond better to uh, the problem of family violence and violence against women in their congregations. The, the work is collaborative because it is from our partnerships with members of the community, with government and with direct service providers that we understand what re research is important and necessary to address the questions of today. And so it's by staying close to partners like the Anglican Diocese of Fredericton and uh, the many, many churches, religious groups, public service providers, therapeutic professionals around the country and in fact around the world that our researchers have worked with. And so um, I'm just so delighted that um, Nancy is able to share uh, her work with you and I'm looking forward to hearing her presentation. Thank you very much, Kathy. Okay, I'm hoping now that you've been able to see the title so you know who I am, you know what the title of the talk is, you know what the date is, and you know that we're in Fredericton. One of the first pieces I wrote on violence in the family context I entitled From the Heart of My Laptop. The title was meant to signify that working on issues of abuse extracts an enormous cost from the researcher as well as those with whom she might choose to study. It was work that brought me face to face with suffering inside and beyond the walls of our communities of faith. It would transform how I understood the research process and it would give me enormous opportunities to translate my work and to go public, as it were. Together with a fantastic team of graduate students and colleagues and with research money to use, I have had the privilege of speaking out against the holy hush, of helping to shatter the silence and of building up the collaborative community response to this critical social issue. In many interesting places around the globe and in the pages of the books I have written, we've been able to help to pave the pathway between the steeple and the shelter. We have listened to the stories of those who have been abused, and we have listened to the stories of those who have acted abusively. And I have been fortunate to speak about my research in large and small gatherings, in churches and universities and in conferences, and actually as people sit in front of their computers as you're doing tonight. All things I never really thought would be possible. Every Sunday, millions of women across Canada, the United States, and indeed around the world, join together with other believers in congregational life to worship God and to fellowship and study with others of like faith, either in person or now online. Amidst the singing, the teaching and the sweet Sunday smiles, there's often a very ugly secret. Sometimes that secret is disclosed in the pastoral study together with the fear and the shame and the tears it creates. Sometimes part of that secret is whispered to others who inquire of bruises or absences or the look of dismay that can cloud the eyes as well as the countenance. Often it is disclosed one woman to another, hushed as if speaking the truth out loud would jeopardize the friendship, the trust or the practical help that is so critical to a victim and her children. Violence against women is a pervasive reality it exists in every country of the world, amongst all people groups, in every faith community. 
and it knows no socioeconomic boundaries. Rich women, poor women, black women, white women, educated women, religious women, beautiful women, all women can be potential carpets. Governments around the globe are waking up to the reality of the devastating consequences of violence against women. And public money is starting to trickle towards a greater understanding of the problem of abuse, reforming the judicial system to respond more quickly and providing health and other social services. Yet, amidst the growing recognition of the everyday fears for the safety and security of women, the bruises and battering they experience and their needs for safety, where are the churches? Where are the synagogues? Where are the mosques? Where are the people of deep religious commitment? And why are so many of us still sound asleep? While many people in Canada, and I'm assuming most of you who are joining us this evening, are familiar with the statistics denoting the prevalence and severity of intimate partner violence in our broader communities, few people have considered the specific role of faith communities when violence strikes families, strikes women, strikes men, and strikes children. Families that are connected to houses of worship and who find strength and support from others of like minds there. As a result, a holy hush pervades many religious organizations, cathedrals and small houses of worship alike. Leaders as well as followers deny what is happening in their midst and they're unable as a result to respond with compassion and best practices. As a result, many are prone to sweep the issue under the proverbial church or mosque carpet. Let's be honest, there is a lot of evidence of a holy hush that still permeates, permeates our communities of faith. In case you need convincing, consider just a few pieces of evidence from our research. Most religious leaders do not name violence in the family context for what it is. Instead, they refer to family conflict or disagreements or problems of communication. Mostly women, but a small percentage of men as well, and those particularly in heterosexual relationships are more prone to look to the church or to their faith communities for help in the aftermath of violence. Most religious leaders have never visited the transition house in their local area. They don't know any of the workers there by name, nor do they have their phone number available in an easily accessible location. Working collaboratively for them is often an intellectual and a practical stretch. Most clergy have never preached a message that explicitly condemns wife abuse, child abuse, or abuse directed towards men. Most ministers do not include any information about violence in their premarital counseling packages with couples. Most leaders of youth groups never talk about violence in dating relationships, nor do they encourage young men and women to identify and practice healthy interpersonal encounters. When women who've been victimized come to their faith communities for help, pastors and other religious leaders are often reluctant to refer them to outside community resources, to the experts. Keep it hushed. Sometimes religious leaders do not offer spiritual comfort to victims, like reading passages from the Bible or other holy book, or praying with them to God for strength. They simply don't know what to do. So they try to provide what they think a community service might do, but without the expertise that goes along with it. Yet, there is a rumbling in some church closets that cannot be silenced, and it's getting louder all the time. It is determined to shatter the silence about abuse, particularly in families of faith. When abuse strikes in a religious home, many women look first and foremost to their pastor and their congregation for help. What will they find? What advice will they be given? This is where, for me, we work on action after knowledge. After we know something of the suffering of those in our communities, what are we going to do about it? What skills and energy and passion can we bring to make a difference? 
my work of knowledge translation, where the data collected from our studies uh, help to and, and where it's prepared for dissemination to a wider public, uses the motif of a stained glass to tell the story we've learned from our research. And here I'm going to refer to our online series of resources called the RAVE Project. RAVE standing for Religion and Violence E-Learning, the RAVE Project. You can, you can Google it later on www.theraveproject.org. Stained glass, long a symbol associated with Christian churches, is a reminder that beauty can be born from brokenness. Jagged pieces of glass, rough to the touch and piercing to the skin, can be transformed. That is the story to which I now turn, a story based on our fieldwork and created in, for us in real stained glass. You see here the beginning where everything is intact. Then you follow through to the chaos where nothing ever looks the same again. Then the aftermath, then the rebuilding. And that's where often we come together as a faith community to help people see all of the parts of their lives that they can harness at this point in time. Then of course, there's the rebuilding and the renewal and new beginnings. When the language of the spirit infuses the language of contemporary culture, new images can be created from broken pieces of glass. The language of the spirit involves words of religious comfort to victims and words of religious accountability to offenders. The language of contemporary culture involves recognizing principles of safety and empowerment and justice and empathy. For religious men and women, weaving together the language of the spirit with the language of contemporary culture is very powerful. When religious leaders speak out against violence, they use their moral authority to bring healing to victims and call those who act abusively to accountability. It begins to shatter the silence of the holy hush. Highly committed religious women are often very reluctant to leave their husbands and to seek alternate solutions for their personal safety and their emotional health. They feel that they've promised to love and honor their husbands until death, to keep on forgiving, yes, 70 times seven, to keep on trying to salvage their marriages and to never give up hope that their husbands might change. Through our research, we have found that most religious women who are abused do not consider themselves to be battered wives. In fact, Julie Owens, a nationally recognized DV trainer and herself a religious survivor, tells part of her story where after her husband had been charged with murder and sent to prison, she heard about a program for battered wives in the state of Hawaii and she called to see if she might come. She told the advocate on the phone, I am not a battered wife, but my husband tried to kill me. The resources that religious women seek in the aftermath of domestic violence help to differentiate them from other abused women. They are often reluctant to seek secular community-based sources of support, preferring to look to others of like-minded faith for assistance, pastors and lay people alike. Since many faith communities place the intact family on a pedestal, religious women are especially prone to blame themselves for the abuse. And they believe they have promised God to stay married until death. And as a result, they often experience both the fear and the reality of rejection in their communities, their faith communities, when attempts to repair the relationship fail. Justice, accountability, and change are all imperative features of intervention services offered to men who abuse their partners. While some come voluntarily, most men who attend batter intervention classes do so because they have little choice in the matter. They've been mandated by the courts as a result of a conviction for domestic violence, or they've been referred by their wives, therapists, and or clergy as a final gasp 
before the relationship is considered dead. Religious women in particular are very hopeful that intervention programs can change violent men. Since many abused religious women do not wish to terminate their relationship with the abuser, either temporarily or forever, they hold a great faith that if only their partner were to attend such a program, the violence would cease and peace would be restored to the marriage. But is there any evidence upon which to base such hope? For many years, we have been studying Christian men who abuse their partners. One finding to emerge from this data is the role of clergy in encouraging or mandating men to seek help or to attend a faith-based intervention program. In fact, in some of our studies, men who were clergy referred were more likely to complete and graduate from a program than men whose attendance was mandated by a judge alone. Sharing a religious worldview with other men in the program may actually provide a safe place for abusive men to challenge themselves and each other and look toward a day when their abusive past will no longer control their present reality. When issues of spirituality or religion or the Bible are raised by the men, the facilitators are able to respond using the language of their various faith traditions. They're knowledgeable about the Bible and well prepared to counter any claims made by the men that scripture justifies abuse or violent acts. They hold men accountable using both secular and religious language. And for men of faith, this is very powerful. Here, a man's religious ideology is harnessed in ways that has the potential to nature, to sorry, to nurture, monitor, and reinforce a violent free future. You see, when religious leaders are able to walk alongside abusive men and their families, the possibilities of ongoing accountability are enhanced. In this way, pastors and other religious leaders are uniquely positioned to augment the process of recovery. For collaborative ventures between churches and community agencies to be successful in the fight to end domestic violence, personnel from both paradigms must realize the need to work together. A cultural language that is devoid of religious symbols, meaning and legitimacy is relatively powerless to alter a religious victim's resolve to stay in the marriage, no matter what the cost. Moreover, curbing violent behavior amongst religious men who believe they are entitled by their tradition to behave in this way must include spiritual language condemning the violence and religious resources to empower hope and change. Correspondingly, the language of the spirit must also include references to practical resources and secular knowledge. Otherwise, spiritual language alone may compromise a victim's need for safety, security, and financial resources to care for herself and her children, or for a perpetrator's need for justice and restraint. So you might ask, what can one person or congregation do? Well, I'm really glad you've asked that. On our WAVE website, we have a whole series of resources, and I'm just going to click through a couple of pages here so you can see. We have violence around the world. We have frequently asked questions. We have stories that are linked to our work. And we have the Help Now page where you can click on and you can then see where is the closest shelter for which I could, from which I can receive help. There are five things every congregation can do. I mean, of course, there are many more, but five I'm going to mention. First is to ensure that safety is the top priority and that information is available. Place a poster or other related information about abuse near or in the pastor's study or waiting area or online that gives the message, Christian love should not hurt. Secondly, place a brochure on abuse in every church washroom together with contact information from the shelter or transition house. Because you know, bathroom stalls are one of the few very confidential places where you can pick up information and no one can see you. 
If I were to pick up information on abuse in the rotundra of my congregation, my name would be on the prayer chain before I got to the car. Next, you can identify one Sunday in the calendar year to discuss abuse and place an insert in the bulletin with relevant information concerning abuse and how to seek help. Mention also the needs of the community related to abuse and how interested church members can offer assistance like financial or in-kind donations to the women's shelter. Next, we can ensure that every youth group has one evening at least once per term where abuse and dating relationships is discussed and where teens are encouraged to ask for assistance if they or someone they know is part of an unhealthy relationship. And then we should discuss the issue of abuse in all premarital counseling that occurs within a church-based setting. Our data shows that when it is discussed, a woman is more likely to return to her pastor later if abuse occurs. You see, eradicating family violence is a central component to healthy relationships everywhere, including the church. It is time to stop the holy hush. It is time to wake up to the reality and the pervasiveness of abuse both within and beyond the walls of our congregations. And every community church can be a place where it's safe to disclose, knowing you'll receive practical and spiritual support. Now, this has been a brief overview of my work. And I've been so happy to be able to share a bit of it with you. And we'll talk about it later in our, in our question time. But now I'd like to turn more directly to my personal reflections on the research and activism with which I've been involved in the last 25 years. And we'll work through, of course, some of the points I put together as our time allows. Some things have not changed very much at all over the last 25 years. Let's talk about some of the data first, as you see on the slide before you. We collected data in 1992, and we collected some similar data in 2017. In both time periods, the most frequent cases to ask for pastoral assistance were a woman who was being abused by her husband or partner, a woman who had been abused in the past by her parents, and a man who was being abusive towards his partner. And the harm has not changed either. The harm that is caused to individuals and families, to children, and to the broad social network. It is true, women are more likely to be harmed than men, much more likely. And they are more frequently the ones who will actually go to churches and faith communities for assistance. Many religious women do look to our faith communities and what they find there or don't find there in part charts the course of what happens next. Secondly, Another factor that has not changed in the last 25 years is the proportion of religious leaders who claim they've preached a message condemning intimate partner violence or child abuse. About one in three said that they did in the early 1990s and again in 2017. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. I'm over 60 years old and for most of my life, I've heard at least one, if not two, and sometimes three messages a week. So let's be on the safe side. Let's say for 50 years, I've listened to an average of 80 messages a year or 4,000 messages in my lifetime. How many messages have I ever heard condemning intimate partner violence that I did not preach myself? Not very many. I count less than five. One or two by my dear friend and colleague, Gordon Conwell theologian, Dr. Catherine Clark Crager from Boston, when we were on a speaking tour together, and a couple by a friend who's a Baptist pastor in New Zealand, Reverend Daphne Marsden. There are others, I'm sure, but those are the ones I can remember. Hearing a message about this issue does, not, does many things, including highlighting for a victim who's sitting there that the church wants to be present with her, reminding others of the prevalence and severity of abuse, and producing a culture within our congregations that we stand up against abuse and that we stand for just and loving relations between all people, families and otherwise. 
Third, something that has changed is that religious leaders by and large have less experience responding to abuse and to those who've been abused than they did 25 years ago. This is true in terms of victims and it's true in terms of those who act abusively. Now, let me be clear. This is not necessarily something to celebrate. Over the course of 25 years, religious victims, most of them women, have learned through talking to others and listening to their religious leaders that their communities of faith are not ready to talk about or do, do something practical to help to respond to intimate partner violence. So they now look elsewhere, but abuse strikes their homes and their lives. Our silence or our holy hush has sent them elsewhere, not by referral, which would be appropriate to work together with community-based resources, but by default. So while clergy are more equipped to respond now than they were 25 years ago, fewer of their parishioners are looking to them for assistance. Fourth, some, something else that has changed and not for the better, is that fewer religious leaders are discussing intimate partner violence as part of their marriage preparation work with couples seeking marriage by a religious leader. The percentage of religious leaders who identify the topic of intimate partner violence in their premarital sessions has declined from 40% in 1992 to 31% in 2017. This is very, very unfortunate because when it's raised in that context to a couple who are sitting there happy to be thinking about their marriage and what's about to occur, it lays the groundwork that if this happens later, or indeed if this is happening now, the church is a safe place to look for help. Number five, it's hard to overestimate the importance of seminary training in the life of a religious professional. That is one of the reasons why our team has worked diligently to include seminarians in our data collection and to accept as much as possible speaking engagements to those training for ministry. There is some evidence that religious leaders are now better equipped to work with victims and perpetrators than they were 25 years ago, but there is still a marked chasm between the seminarian's own perceptions of how well they will be trained at the end of their university experience and their actual reporting of it during their last term of seminary before graduation. From my perspective though, I have witnessed quite a change in this regard. I remember earlier on in my speaking career addressing in a seminary context at the invitation of the uh, the president of the uh, seminary, I was asked with Dr. Catherine Clark Krager to talk to a mandated audience of a, a, an assembly of all of their students. It was in Croatia. And we got up to speak and we began to speak. There were probably 100 or 125 there. And the heckling from the back of the room was so loud that Kathy Krager and I had to raise our voices and try to see if we couldn't get the microphone to carry us even louder to overcome the heckling. I'm happy to say that that doesn't happen now. Number six, when I first started working with religious communities and their response to abuse, there was very little understanding of how they might work collaboratively with those groups and professionals working on this issue in community-based agencies. There was skepticism and mistrust and there was very little appetite for changing the way things were done. This was as true in the secular community as it was in the sacred one. I used to sometimes say in a, in a group setting, if there were both secular uh, community-based agency professionals there and religious leaders, I would say to the religious leaders, is your pastoral study or your church a safe place for a victim to disclose that she's been abused? And most of the heads of the secular workers would go like this. And then I would say to the secular workers, and is your community agency a safe place to say it's religion, that, that a woman is religious? And that's when the religious leaders would shake their heads. There's growing recognition that it's more than one profession or more than one agency needed to work together 
in order to combat domestic violence. We have to work beyond our separate silos. And as a result, it's incumbent upon all agencies and churches and workers to cooperate and collaborate. Number seven, I have always believed that education is key to changing how we think on a variety of issues, including intimate partner violence. I still believe this, but more now than ever. I think it's ongoing training that is so critical for religious workers and community-based workers as they seek to work together, offering compassion and best practices in the work they do. Of course, safety must always be our first priority, but then we need to listen, to refer, to empower, and to offer resources to those whose lives have been devastated. But changes occur over time. Disclosures occur differently now than they did in the past. And the personnel and the agencies and the churches are changing. And one very important thing in working together between religious organizations and the community is that workers know each other. And so when, when, when pastors change, when, when workers change, it's really important to have context for getting together and realizing that there is a shared basis on which uh, they can continue the work. Ongoing training for lay people and professionals is also very important. And here, faith communities can be of assistance. Many faith communities have very advanced websites and they have regular gatherings in person and online. They have relevant and correct information on their websites about abuse and they can signal to their community that this is an important issue. Number eight, I've always believed too that resources are critical for transition houses and second stage housing, for coordinated criminal justice response, for direct assistance and support for victims and survivors, and for an appropriate response to keep abusers accountable and to help them to change their abusive ways. Because resources are costly, this means that we all have a role to play in lobbying our governments at all levels to ensure that adequate access and availability of resources is there for all women and children and men too, and that they live in environments that are safe, fear from, sorry, free from the fear or the reality of abuse, whether it's physical or emotional or financial or spiritual or verbal or it's stalking, the list is very long. The point is an important one. We need to condemn these acts of abuse, but then we need to be prepared to respond. And appropriate and available resources at the community level must be part of that response. Finally, I believe that our goal as a faith community needs to be that we will try to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. We need to strive never to ignore, minimize, or deny abuse in our midst. And we must be resolved to offer assistance in keeping with our training and our capacities, as well as working together in a cooperative and collaborative fashion with those in our community. As people of faith, we need to learn how to play well in the sandbox, impacting the communities where we live and where we work. You see, I believe together we can make a difference in the lives of the brokenhearted. There is no place like home. But when violence strikes, there is no home. Every relationship deserves to be uh, respectful and full of healthy interactions where intimidation and control are absent. Supporting victims and calling those who act abusively to accountability is something every one of us can do in our homes, in our communities, and in our churches. I am so very grateful for the opportunity to be with you all this evening. Thank you for joining me. And now I look forward to your questions, your suggestions, and your comments. Thank you, Nancy, for that. That was, um, I'm hesitating because I want to say that was wonderful, but the topic's not wonderful. <laughs> Um, but um, your presentation uh, was uh, great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, as a reminder, um, for those who would like to pose a question to Nancy, um, if you hit the uh, Q&A button on the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, uh, you'll have a place uh, to put your question in there. 
uh, and you should have the option to uh, make it anonymous uh, if you uh, would like to do that you're welcome to do that so we'll give people a moment or two uh, to do that um uh, nancy just as we're waiting uh for questions to come in uh -huh. um when you when you began your 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 research and study and um i'll use uh, your ministry as well what led what led you into this um specific field well, I'm a sociologist of religion by training. And uh, during my uh, early years of work, I was very interested in the ordination of women to the priesthood in the Church of England. And so I was in school in England, and that was the time when this was all being debated and so on. And so when I came back first to Canada, uh, back home, as it were, because New Brunswick is my home, um, when I came back, I would be invited. Those were the days of the big women's conventions, and I would be invited to speak. And I would do something like call, that I would call jugglers for Jesus, where I talk about women's role at home and church and the family and the challenge that they were facing and, and so on and so forth. And it was at that point I started to hear women say to me, you never talk about conflict. Mm. And so that was my very first initiation. And then what began to happen is then I would raise a little bit about this and then Honestly, I'd go to my hotel room afterwards, and sometimes there'd be two or three calls on my phone, anonymous, saying, you need to say more about this. And then an opportunity came in the early 1990s. Actually, Margaret McCain had asked if I might be part of an initiative to look at this at UMB and whether I personally would be interested in studying faith communities. And so that was really, at that point, I thought, we're angels fear to tread. Um, but that's how it all began. And so I started doing work, data collecting, as, as some of you may know, I data, did data collection with the Anglicans in, in New Brunswick and with many, many religious groups. And so it sort of started there in the early 90s. And then, of course, what happens is you get a little bit of international exposure. And then if you're cheap, and you don't really mess up, you get invited more. And so what happened is over time, um, you know, more and more opportunities came and then the work went a little more. Uh, we, we started to publish more and we would, you know, it, it, it begins to, and then it's easier to get more research money after you've done that. And so it begins to take on a little bit of a life of its own. But in the early years, it was, it was quite hard slogging because uh, people in faith communities were really not open to understand or to acknowledge that this was happening in their midst. And I'm not saying that they're real open now, but we are more open as faith communities than we were in the past. Well, thanks for that, Nancy. Uh, Thomas is asking, is domestic violence more prevalent in faith communities than others? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Thank you for that. It's something I'm asked a lot. And we, uh, what I would like to say to that is the data that's available suggests that it's at similar rates in faith communities as it is in the communities of which they are part. But most religious people don't believe that to be true. And that's part of the challenge is that even pastors and priests and others who work in religious contexts usually feel that in their own communities, the rates are lower. And so their um, sens sensitivities to these issues are often um, diminished in the, in the places where they work because they're not expecting this to take place. In the secular community, um, when I'm interviewed by the press, they're expecting me to say that it's more prevalent in communities of faith. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that that is true. What is true is that in the uh, in faith communities, the trajectory after abuse is different. Women are less likely to leave uh, abusive relationships. They're less likely to look for help outside of their faith community, and they're uh, more likely to put a lot of trust in programs that are working with abusive men. And some of that, of course, is changing over time. But in our early work in particular, there was a great reluctance amongst many religious uh, survivors in terminating the relationship with the abuser and even setting for themselves safety for themselves and their children as something that they were going to pursue wholeheartedly. And I, I want to say this is not about blaming those women. It's understanding the context that they did not believe they had support 
in their communities of faith. And because their faith was such an important part of who they were, they could not imagine life without the faith community and life without the support of those who are, were of like mind from a spiritual point of view. And so I think that we need to be very cognizant in our faith communities that it is in our midst and that we need to be uh, very aware of this. We need to be um, vigilant and we also need to have programs, particularly for our youth. And, you know, violence doesn't occur in just one age group. I mean, uh, you know, el there's elder abuse, there's all sorts of violence. And so we just need to be aware that our communities, our faith communities can be the healing balm of Gilead to those who are suffering. And we can bring resources and we can bring knowledge and we can bring compassion and best practices to help those who are hurting. Thanks, Nancy. There's uh, two questions that um, tag right onto this, so I'm going to ask them both together. Um, one is, are there resources like a kit that a church could pick up? Um, I know both websites have a number of resources um, listed. There's, there are a lot of resources now. I mean, there are many books that are written. There are many brochures and, and shorter I, you know, uh, uh, items that are, are easy to transport and, and copy. There are websites that you can refer individuals to. And so I would suggest uh, if you're interested, you could start with our RAVE website, which we have quite a lot of resources on our RAVE website. We have resources that you can download and print. We have resources that you can share. We have resources that if you're working with someone, you can call up our RAVE website and, and use some of the resources there. Our stained glass story of abuse for those churches that are a bit more tech savvy. You can use that as the banner while a uh, for a uh, announcement or if a sermon is being preached. We have examples of sermons. We have passages of scripture that you can read. We have a plethora of resources on our own website. And then, as Kathy has mentioned, there is the the center uh, website, and there are lots of other resources too. Uh, the Anglican Communion now worldwide from in the UK. Uh, uh, have uh, has an has an office where uh, they're producing resources on a regular basis. I was speaking with Mandy today, and it, I don't have her email right beside me. But uh, if you were to email me after this, I would be happy to make the link with her. And uh, I, I just think that if you you Google on um, uh, Christian religion and resources for domestic violence. You can find some resources. You can also go to many of the denominational headquarter websites, and they too will have um, some resources that they put together. Sometimes those are premarital counseling resources. Some of those are a safety plan for helping uh, a woman to plan on, on uh, thinking about leaving a, a situation where her safety can't be assured. Sometimes the resources can be used in the pastoral study because it may not be safe for a woman to actually take in her hand resources. Um, away with her. So, and you know, libraries in the community are places where you can go and you can look up information if it's not safe to do that at home. Um, picking up on that as well, um, talking about, um, you know, um, I loved your examples and I wish I had thought of it when I was doing youth ministry myself, of having those conversations at youth group and, and, and things like that. Um, uh, Shelby is um, asking the question, if there's been any research into what age is appropriate uh, to begin having these conversations with kids? Well, it's always appropriate to say we shouldn't hurt other people. Mm. I think that starts from the time you're very little. And uh, so I think, you know, obviously the, the information needs to be tailored for the age group and, and different communities are comfortable with certain ways of talking about this. You can incorporate the parents if you're going to do something in a Sunday school class to talk about it beforehand, what might be done. It's a great way to raise some uh, awareness in the congregation by saying, let's think together how we're going to talk to our children about some of these issues. In terms of teenagers, I mean, uh, you know, uh, dating relationships and interpersonal, um, close interpersonal encounters between uh, teens happens. And we just are putting our heads in the sand if we think it doesn't. So it's really, really important to begin talking about these things in a context where, you know, many youth groups 
except in COVID times, meet once a week. And youth leaders are often looking for content to use uh, during those meetings. And so, you know, um, we've begun uh, with various groups, you know, pilot projects where we looked at cartoon characters. We've done others where you did sort of a, a game time on, on issues of uh, related to this to talk about solutions. We've, we've put together scenarios, but it's not about one person putting together resources. It's really about a faith community or a church in a rural area saying, we're gonna take this on for the spring or for Lent. We're going to think about this with our youth group and how can we do that? How can we begin the conversation? And what would be most appropriate in our context? Are there some particular situations that have come to light or that many people know about in a particular context? Is there uh, a particular problem in terms of cell phone use or stalking or whatever it might be? I think we start with what's in our local context and we say, how can we, as a community of faith, prepare our young people better than they've been prepared in the past? And I think we can all do that. I'm, I'm very optimistic we can begin that conversation. Mm. Um. We have a question. Uh, this uh, individual says, I understood that the top three careers of abuses, abusers, sorry, were in no particular order, military, police, and clergy. Have you found that clergy are prone to be abusers more than others? Well, I know that I, I've read, I've read that too. And I certainly have met many clergy who have been abusive. I have met many, many, many others who have not been. And so I think that's why we need accountability everywhere. I mean, no person should have ultimate control over the life, even in their family or in their church or in their uh, whatever context they find themselves. And so I think that's why it's very important for maybe a church board or the vestry or for other um, leadership teams to talk about this widely. And so that we're calling everybody to account. We're calling everybody to account, not just for what I might say would be physical abuse, but verbal put downs and inappropriate um, display of examples and, you know, um, other things that make us uncomfortable about how people treat one another. And I think one of the things that religious leaders can do is they can monitor what it would look like to treat your family well. And I would say to those who are in leadership in a uh, local congregation, if, if you do not feel comfortable about how your religious leader is interacting with others, that's a conversation that needs to happen by those who are empowered to do so by your, whatever, you know, the hierarchy of your, uh, you know, uh, denominational beliefs are. Are there particular denominations or sects that do a better or worse job of training uh, their seminarians to be prepared to respond appropriately uh, to violence disclosures? Well, that's that's an interesting question. And I'd say that if you'd asked me that 25 years ago, I would have said that the interesting thing is that the more conservative denominations took a lot more, um, what shall we say, ridicule from uh, many communities for not equipping their pastors when those were the various communities who had the most people coming to them for help. And so there's there's both the being prepared to respond and having the right words and understanding of the issue. More liberal contexts tend to have had the words and they might have had a bit more training, but they didn't always necessarily put that to practice in their local context because they didn't believe that good whenever it would be like us do those kinds of things. That's those down the road who are in other kinds of, of context. So I think really what's happened though more recently is that most seminaries have now been either urged by those who are attending them or by the leadership or by funders or by faculty or by some outside sources to begin to talk about this. And so whether it's happened really willingly or whether it's happened as a result of some kind of a challenge to do so, I think most are discussing it now. The problem as I see it is that until it's incorporated into the curricula, it just becomes one more add-on. 
like one lecture on domestic violence in three years of seminary is going to do very little to equip someone to be able to deal with the, the kinds of issues that you'll be faced with in pastoral ministry. And usually on seminary campuses, there are the important professors, and those do not tend to be the, the practical theology or the counseling pastors. Those are the Old Testament scholars, the New Testament scholars. And so that's why we've challenged the seminaries we've worked with to ensure that maybe there's one lecture in every single class during a term where the faculty member uses whatever would be the content that they're discussing, but they bring in the issue of domestic violence. So if you're an Old Testament professor and you talk about Hagar, that has a lot of impact with the students who are there. And so I think that really when we talk about incorporating it in a, in a serious, engaged way in the seminary, it means really thinking about how does this permeate and impact various things that we do. And I must say that some seminaries are, are doing that really quite well. Like right now, Acadia is very forward thinking in, in their seminary. They've, they've uh, appointed um, Dr. Stephen McMullen, and he is very, this is an area that he's interested in, he's, he's published in, he's doing research in, and he's been very forward thinking in, in terms of how they can work together in that seminary. And so have several other professors there. Gordon Conwell Seminary in um, the United States in Boston has been very forward. <clears throat> so I think it's about taking the challenge and saying, how are we as a training community going to look very seriously at this issue? And that's not easy to do. So true. Um, uh, would you say that um, there is different types of church leadership models that seem to be able to help women in these situations better or able to address the issue better um, from your research? <clears throat> well, of course there are many, many ministry models. And uh, I've worked with, you know, some of the very large congregations in Canada and the U.S., you know, where there's, you know, many thousand people who come on a, on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night to, to church. And in those contexts, what they tend to do is they have one woman pastor. She's not the lead or solo pastor. She's not the preaching pastor. She's the all things bad, go see her pastor. And <clears throat> what happens in those contexts and I'm, I'm, I'm not disparaging of those women. They work extremely hard in their counseling ministries and they put resources together. But the person who is in the, the, uh, at the top of the hierarchy, the this, this senior pastor or the pastor who is most revered needs to speak out against abuse and then empower others under his or her leadership to follow through with some of the practical work like counseling and resources and so on. What tends to happen in the, in the model where there's multiple pastors is that it's the counseling pastor who is, is given the task of, of working with those whose lives who are brokenhearted and, and other pastors, because I mean, they're visit, very busy people too, but what they tend to do is a bit wash their hands of the issue. And so I understand that there needs to be streamlining of tasks and duties. I, I, I understand how it is to, to have you know, multiple tasks in a, in a large organization, but it is very important if we want to say that the faith community stands against this, that everyone in each position has an opportunity once in a while to say that. Now you don't have to preach a whole message on abuse to say that abuse is wrong. You can include something about abuse in the pastoral prayer. Some of the congregations will include something about abuse on Valentine's Day. What a hard day for a religious victim to go to church and have a parade of men extolling the virtues of their wives, the pastor supporting this as if every family is perfect. So Valentine's Day is a great day in the pastoral prayer to remember those who have been abused in the, in the uh, intimate relationships uh, of which they find themselves. Mother's Day is another wonderful example of including the fact that many women um, who are single parents, many women who are still in intact relationships, but those relationships are abusive. They come on 
uh, Mother's Day looking to be supported and often they, they don't hear any support for the situation they find themselves in. So I think there's a whole variety of ways that we can do this if we're serious. So to, to, to circle back to the question, which was, uh, what about different ministry models? I don't think there's any ministry model that can be excused from everyone needing to deal with this issue once in a while. Of course, the solo pastor working on his or her own, that's a challenge. You have to be all things to everyone as much as you possibly can be. And there, of course, the challenges are great. What I've heard from many women pastors is that other male pastors in their region or area will then um, refer those who come to them for help with domestic violence to the woman pastor in an adjoining parish. And that is not fair to the woman pastor. What would be much better is to take a day and have them ask the woman pastor to be engaged in training if this is something that she specializes in and, and something that she's interested in doing and then learn from her experience so that um, all different uh, pastors in the area can, can offer some help. Now, of course, not everyone will become an expert and I, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not expecting that that would be the case, but everyone should be able to say that abuse is wrong and that it's not supported in our faith tradition and that we stand firm against it. Mm, thank you, Nancy. Um, has any research been done uh, regarding family violence in Muslim communities here in Canada? Well, I personally have not done that research, although I've been engaged with many people who have. I've spoken on panels with others who've collected data. And of course, our own Dr. Catherine Holtman has been engaged in working in a multi-faith uh, way in her work. And so she would be a very good contact. I, I don't know, Kathy, if you want to speak up now to that, or you could contact her later. Um, I'll just make a note to, to Kathy if she'd like to speak to that, just to send me a message and we can bring her in. Okay, um, but one thing I could say is that there certainly are resources available and there are many who are very interested in, you know, working in the Muslim community. Um, I was on a conference call this morning at 7.30 with some colleagues in the UK and in Ethiopia. And certainly they're working in the Muslim community there um, in addition to other faith communities. And so I think it's something that together we need to speak out about this issue and to equip each other. But of course, it's very important to have the language and the understanding of the faith tradition within your working because that's how people can be called to account. And that of course is how you bring spiritual help and, and whole, wholeness to others. Great. I'm just going to uh, invite Kathy. Uh, Perfect. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, thanks for this question. And I'd just like to uh, begin with a caveat. I think similar to the earlier question that asked if uh, domestic violence is more likely to happen in families of faith, there exists a stereotype of Muslims um, in Canada, but also in, in other countries in, in what we call the West, is that Muslim families are more violent than, than other religious families. And we simply don't have evidence for this. Um, this is built on a, a, a stereotype and a lot of fear um, that has been generated after 9-11. So just to begin by saying that, um, just like Nancy said, uh, families of faith in the Christian tradition are no more likely than um, non-religious families to experience violence. We find that that's the same for um, Muslim families. Uh, recently, I've been working with uh, Dr. Mohammed Bayabade from the Muslim Resource Center for Social Support and Inclusion in London, Ontario. And we're collaborating um, on uh, several projects in which um, we're engaging with Muslims who are interested in, in working on Muslim family safety. And one of these projects is, is taking place in, in Fredericton and we're just in the early stages. So yes, there is um, research uh, going on um, on uh, uh, Muslim families and violence. And similar to some of the work that Nancy's done over the years, we're working at um, you know multiple with multiple groups within the community, multiple ages, and um, and the other thing that's that's really interesting, I think here, as many Fredertonians will know, is that we have a a very diverse 
Muslim community. And um, that is a, a challenge because we only have, there's only two mosques and many Muslims are not um, um, attached to a, a religious community because of the diversity of, of faith and ethnic practices. So um, we have a, 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 a very diverse community, but we have a lot of enthusiasm amongst Muslim and Arab leaders in Fredericton to address this problem. And so that's very encouraging and I'm happy to be working with them. Thank you, Kathy. That's great. Um, are there resources for um, indigenous women experiencing domestic violence? Well, there are actually a lot of resources. And um, if you were to go to the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research website, there would be links to some of those resources. And if you were interested in having some direct links, you could either email Kathy uh, at the center or you could email me and we would be happy to do that. And I think that uh, one of the very interesting projects actually sitting at my desk, I'm just sitting here and I notice one of the bookmarks that a number of years ago, one of the indigenous women's groups had prepared um, on domestic violence. And I just happened to have it here because I find it so um, warm and inviting for help and, and it's, it's listing their website. So sure, you could email me directly or you could email the center. Thank you for that. I love that um, the bottom of that is cut into the shape of the, the yeah. front, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, much of um, what, what you were able to share, Nancy, um, talks about uh, men abusing women. Um, are there resources um, for men who are being abused as well, or is, is there much research in that field? Well, there's not as much research in that field. It's, it's, it's true to say. Many of the resources that are prepared for uh, victims can be translated and, of course, and used uh, with men who find themselves in either same-sex relationships where they are abused or in heterosexual relationships where they're abused. Um, some groups do work directly with men who are victims. And, of course, again, uh, you, could, you could get links to those either by uh, you know, asking one of us or by Googling that. I mean, there are a number of different resources there. One of the things though that I think is really important to bring out in this context is men who are abused by women are very unlikely to go to their churches for help. And I, I mean, I, I've pondered that over the years, why that might be the case, why they would feel in particular that the church wouldn't be a welcoming or listening community to them. And I think partly that has to do with some of the gender dynamics of the past and maybe the present that we, um, we highlight in our church context. And <clears throat> for some men feeling that it's not a place where they could seek help in the aftermath of domestic violence. But let me be very clear, uh, whether you are a woman who is being abused by a man or another woman, or whether you're a man being abused by a partner, it's not right, it's not the Christian way, and there are resources available. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned that oftentimes individuals would find themselves seeking help outside of the religious community because of silence or the holy hush, rather than by referral from leaders. In your experience, how have religious leaders responded to this observation if brought to their attention? Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, it's a really good question. Um, when I work with <clears throat> seminary students, and I, I work with a doctor of ministry program, and have for many, many years now, at a seminary in, in the Boston area. And those are ministry leaders who, who are coming and are, are doing another advanced degree. They're often pastors of fairly sizable congregations, and they have often team ministries. And when they're confronted with some of the data that I'm asked to present and, and the, the workshops I do with them, that's part of their, their experience, they often go home and they don't, they're not always sure I'm right. And they go home to do something and then they find, oh, hmm, maybe what she said, maybe I need to think a little bit more about this. And I guess the point I want to make is that it takes many voices saying the same thing a number of times before it leads to action. 
And one of the ways that I've tried to help religious leaders deal with the, uh, the secular community is to talk about how do you approach someone at a shelter if you're a pastor? Like, what do you say? How do you open the conversation? And how do you welcome the uh, shelter and the shelter staff into your faith community by maybe offering for them to do a display at some point or to have a speaking engagement at some point? You see, we need these, these um, the pathway to be bi-directional. We need to think about as religious leaders, how do we not just tell people in the community what to do, but how do we ask them and participate with them and share with them? I like to talk about the sandbox because I think sometimes as religious people, we're not really good at playing in the sandbox together. And so I think we need to learn how to do that. And what we often find, and, and I've done some of these trainings myself, where we've had a Canadian government grant to bring religious leaders and community-based professionals together. And what happened there is they met each other and they had lunch and they liked each other. And they then started talking to each other. And then they found out that they both coached the basketball team of one of their children and then they found out all sorts of things and then the next time that someone came to that pastor that pastor knew who to call and I mean that sounds really down home but that's how it works it's by knowing other people it's by feeling a level of trust and comfort and that goes both ways and so it, I, I think there are many things that churches can do to foster that and the first thing is by inviting some members of the, the executive director, maybe a member or two of the staff from the shelter to come to a, a, some kind of a meeting at, at your church or your, your parish. or um, And you simply say, we'd like to hear about your work and we'd like to make a donation to that work, a financial donation. And what are some of the needs and how could we make that, you know, aware of that in our community? And so I think we need to start by doing that. And then that opens up opportunities. And before long, you find that the referral process becomes bi-directional. I've worked with people in Calgary over the years, and there they have a very, very fine developed sacred secular collaboration. And in large measure, it was um, <clears throat> produced by and encouraged and nurtured by um, an Anglican priest who uh, was the rector at the cathedral, uh, Robert Pinn. And uh, he's now retired, but he spent many years developing and nurturing the work there. And one of the things he said to me just before he retired, he said, you know, we've worked so hard to, to meet the secular community and we have workshops and many of them come and our church people have been involved in our religious lives, but then everybody changes. And then there are all new people. And then we have to start all over again. And so you see, you can see that as a challenge if you've been doing it a long time, but you can also see it as an opportunity. If you've never been involved, you can get in on the ground level because there'll be some workers there who've never really met a religious leader who was interested in listening to their experience about domestic violence. Mm. I love those examples you gave, and um, I'm glad that there's a number of people on the from the uh, leadership team from the diocese um, with us tonight. Um, I think this will be a conversation we have uh, very soon. Um, and one final question uh, for tonight: uh, Could you explain the basic foundation of domestic violence? Is there any kind of understanding why it occurs? Are there recurring themes present? Um, is there anything known that what causes a partner to abuse their partner or child? Well, when we talk about intimate partner violence, it's really all about control, controlling another, the desire to control another person, what they say, what they do, where they go, where they receive support, what they, how they feel about themselves, how they interact with others. And you see when, many abusers that I've interviewed many, many abusers in my life. And in their words, when they didn't get what they wanted, then they used their fists. That's what they would say. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of abusers that we have, men who've been uh, convicted by the courts. 
And so I think we need to think, what does that issue is the central feature of, of uh, domestic violence. I mean, of course, we could spend hours talking about all the kinds of interconnections. But if you are frightened of your partner and what your partner might do, that's abuse. If you worry about things that are said, if you're put down in public, if who you talk to and get support from is monitored, if somebody's looking at your cell phone saying you've called your mother again, why do you want to talk to her? Those are all issues of control. And so I think we need to be very, very clear that as a faith community, we will not tolerate that. Now, of course, there's another part of this story, and that is we learn to be abuse, abusive in part because we've had experiences in the past. This is called the intergenerational transmission of violence. And that's a fancy phrase really to say that we learn to be violent by the things that we've witnessed in our own childhood home, we've witnessed in the schoolyard, we've witnessed other places. And so this is why it's so critical for faith communities to speak out against this so that we begin to curb the messages that young men and young women receive in other contexts. You see, as a Christian believer, sometimes we are told that we are to be a suffering servant, that we're to forgive 70 times seven, that we're to turn a blind eye when people don't treat us well, and that somehow we'll receive reward in the hereafter if we've allowed ourselves to be a doormat. Well, that's not the message. And the message needs to be that um, our God is interested in the whole person and then the health and the safety of the whole person and that there are spiritual resources to help you if you feel that your safety or your mental health or your physical health is in jeopardy and i want us to i want to put out the challenge to us tonight that you know whether it's physical violence or verbal assaults or emotional abuse or spiritual abuse. I've interviewed, uh, you know, abusers who would rip out pages of the Bible and say, you think you're so spiritual, why don't you gag on this for a while? I mean, there's all sorts of ways to do really, really ugly things. And we want to stand as a faith community against those. And we want to say that not only do we stand against them, but we can do something to help you when you come forward. And we want to be those caring places. Okay, I think uh, Sean was indicating that was the last question. Is that right, Sean? Yes. So okay. I, I do want to um, thank you so much again for sharing uh, with us this evening a very heavy topic. Um, but uh, we thought it was, um, you know, it's a good opportunity to uh, touch on this as an issue because certainly during the pandemic, that's one of the concerns that uh, isolation, economic hardship, all of that has just exacerbated uh, domestic violence. And um, so we do thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And um, I thank you for the resources, the websites, all of that that you have um, uh, shared with us this evening. And we hope that our listeners uh, will take some of this and put it to uh, use in their parishes, their churches, and uh, want to thank you again. And yeah, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, that was um, wonderful and informative. And um, for, so I've received some question uh, from people noting uh, that they see that this webinar has been recorded. Um, it will be uploaded tomorrow morning uh, to the Anglican Diocese of Fredericton website. Uh, which is nb.anglican.ca. Um, and feel free to um, circulate it to anyone who you think um, could benefit from uh, this, these reflections and questions. And um, we'll also post um, the links to the resources and how to get a hold of the center as well. Uh, so thank you again uh, to Nancy and to Catherine and for your work uh, that is so valuable and needed. And uh, for raising uh, the awareness on this. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, it's been good to be with you and 
and hope that this has been helpful for you. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.